from uh, and, uh, I am Philadelphia. From Wilmington. Wilmington. Wilmington, Delaware. Yeah, on that famous 495. I challenge you to ask the astronomers if they believe that Tico Valle was correct or Johannes Kepler was correct. And then you can report back to us, and I will gladly accept all of your accolades because I am most certain is the orbit of Saturn. Apparently, since my death, there has been discovered four moons around Jupiter. But then all of these circle the sun, which in turn goes around the Earth. You see a flaw? And might where that flaw be. And if you are to use my system to predict the dates and times and the motions of the heavens, it has at least the same uncanny accuracy as the Polish astronomer Copernicus. So, Johannes Kepler. And you are I am Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer. I see you are looking at my nose, young man. Yes. Yeah, you broke your nose. Oh, you broke no. your nose. In a wild story. No, it was a math thing. It wasn't broken. It was removed by the tip of a sword in my college days when I was on break in Rostock. A gentleman and I had a discussion over a few too many drinks, perhaps, and in my youthful indiscretion, I decided to, in my hubris, defend my opinions with a sword rather than with tools of science. And I learned a most valuable lesson that luckily it was replaceable, and I've turned it into a, I think, rather stunning fashion accessory. So. If you have an argument with someone over issues of philosophy, or mathematics, or science, or what have you, it is best to settle them with the mind and not the sword. So, there is a valuable lesson for you, my man. Why don't you stand there? But the methanol, the stuff you see in here is also in common. So, we take that all together. We probably don't need to say any magic words. Abracadabra. If you want to, you can, but there is nobody around to say them. Well, I don't think there was anybody. Oh, well, there we go with the mess again. Stop it with the ammonia. The I'm going to get ammonia that's not foaming. All right. So, now this part didn't happen with comets, because we think comets are actually more like the very loose, if you were just to run your hands through a snowbank and just grab snow, because they're very weak and they're very porous. This part is what happened to the asteroids when they melted and pushed together. Uh-oh, I'm not sure if i got enough water in here. That's fine enough. Because if you don't do it right, it doesn't hold together. Right, this one's got a lot of carbon dioxide in it. All right, so there's a number of things you can see. First of all, it's dark in lots of places, but it's also got light bits, got icy bits. It's also foaming and fuming. So one of the things I, we make sure to teach folks is, are comets hot or cold? Cold. And most folks, when you look at a comet in the sky, it looks like it's on fire, right? Yeah. And it looks like it's running through a wind. And one of the things it actually is instead is it's actually ice. And now you can probably see it. I can see it well. I can see it well. Right, but you can see about a greater detail there, right? But when you look at it, it's like 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 I was a Girl Scout for about two years. I was a brownie, went through the brownies completely, but then I moved to Reno and they didn't have any Girl Scouts there, so I was in Girl Guides instead.
So I was in Girl Scouts for a couple of years when I came to Baltimore. When did you know that you wanted to be an astronomer? I decided quite early. Uh, between fifth and sixth grade, I organized my friends into a little astronomy club, and we met once a week during the summer to study the constellations. By the time I was in seventh grade, I was sure that that was what I wanted to do. What did your parents think about your interest in astronomy? My, my mother was a bit skeptical, but they both were supportive. My father was a scientist, but I think maybe he was rather happy that I was going into a science. Did anyone discourage you from pursuing astronomy because you were a girl? Probably a couple of dozen people at least. I, I definitely was told many, many times that a girl could not become a scientist. My first encouragement, if you can call it that, was my junior year in college when the head of the physics department told me, I usually try to talk a girl out of going into physics, but I think maybe you might make it. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for girls that want to be astronomers? Well, I always tell girls that Oh, or anybody else for that matter, that if you like puzzles, science is a good place for you, science or engineering, because you're continually solving puzzles. And as far as astronomy, I think astronomy is a fascinating field. There's so many interesting things to learn about the universe. What do you think is the most interesting thing you have studied, learned, or discovered as an astronomer? Well, I think the most interesting thing I discovered was long ago, uh, I was trying to, I was really studying a large number of stars to find out how far away they were. But when I looked at them carefully, uh, astronomers study stars by spreading the light out into a rainbow that we call a spectrum. And when I did this to all, all of these stars that I was looking at, these were bright stars, stars that you can see with the naked eye in, your, in a dark climate, a dark sky. Um, I found that some of the stars had a little more hydrogen than other stars. And even more interestingly, I found that the stars with more hydrogen stay, were farther from the plane of the Milky Way and moved around the center of the Milky Way in slightly more elongated orbits, whereas the stars with more hydrogen stayed near the Milky Way and, and moved around the center in very circular orbits. And this was the first indication of the evolution of our galaxy because the stars with less hydrogen were actually older. All the hydrogen is made in stars, and so the, when the older stars, the younger stars, were made out of material that had been in stars before and uh, used up the hydrogen, made other elements from it. As I have always said, ad aspera per astra. I thirsted for wisdom, uh, the way a sponge thirsts for water. Uh, I enjoyed schooling, if not my schoolmates. Uh, I was often picked upon by the older, larger boys. Uh, but in one particular occasion, having enough of that, I did thrash the bully with a rather satisfying zeal. Uh, and furthermore, I decided upon thrashing him physically that I would thrash him in his studies as well and outscoring him on every examination for the rest of the term. Uh, I dare say that my temper would stay with me through adulthood. Uncle, I have never seen evidence of such a temper. I have seen in you nothing but felicity, kindness, and avuncular ardor. Alas, Catherine. You have never assailed my primacy of invention, uh, besmirched my work as a natural philosopher like some who I have turned against, uh, like that German in his minion with his 
Insils uh, insisting that he uh, has invented fluxions on his own, uh, or that uh, wretched hunchback, Robert Hook. <laughs> indeed, Uncle, indeed. But what of the felicity I mentioned? Did you not say claim the necessity of making a point without making an enemy? True. You certainly have some more fond recollections of your past. I, I apologize for the angry digression, but uh, I'll tell you. I did, however, find a more happy days once upon uh, my matriculation in Cambridge. Uh, there I would spend the majority of my life. Um, it was a welcome relief from the path that my mother had predicted for me, uh, the, the life of a gentleman farmer. Uh, it was, that would have been most unfulfilling. I do remember when I was a boy and I had a, the chores that one boy has when he lives upon a farm, uh, tending to the hogs and the like. Uh, my family was fined on several occasions because the hogs having broken down the fences and going to eat the, the vegetables in other gardens while I was busying myself reading books on Euclid. Uh, but luckily, uh, reason prevailed and everyone realized that I was rather wasting my time on the farm. Rather. Yeah, indeed. And I was allowed to move to university. Uh, but there, I was only, a, even though my, my family was one of the means, I, I was a enrolled merely as a, what was known as a sizer, uh, I believe a, a word freshman, but lower than that still, one who would actually work for the other students uh, doing menial chores. Uh, but this was a small price to play because I was fully absorbed in the scholarly pursuits there and that was where my mind began to flourish. Um, so, a couple more examples. You know, we see dark craters, we see bright craters, um, and all there's been hundreds of new impact craters that have been resolved. This is uh, the yellow dots here. I think when this is updated, again, we're going to have a huge number. The two red dots are actually ones that were pointed out uh, from the flash observations. Um, oh, and then tens of thousands of surface changes. That These are what we think are either unresolved craters, we can't see the crater, or probably for the most part secondary ejecta from other craters. And we just don't, we're not seeing the, the primary crater, um, but we're seeing its effects farther away. Um, so what have we learned from this? Um, well, one, just kind of practical, one is that hazards from secondary crater ejecta um, are a lot bigger than previously thought. Um, the impactor itself comes in at um, somewhere around, you know, over 10 kilometers per second. Um, so these are hypervelocity impacts, but the secondary ejecta, you know, it's not as fast as that, but it's still faster than a speeding bullet. So you would want to build whatever kind of structure you're going to have on the moon to withstand this kind of sandblasting. Um, the regolith is being gardened a lot, but a lot faster than we previously thought, and then the impact rate um, so far from the data, which is, you know, will improve in its statistical significance as we go along, the rate is um, about a third higher than the model's predictions have suggested. Um, yes, and then this hypervelocity impacts, they cause this jetting of ejecta that really just scours the surface quite far away. And one of the fun things about this is that it's not hard to find these now. Um, the moon is a, a place that is changing, even though it, it's changing slow enough that we still have these ancient features preserved. There is a, a dynamic um, system there that is, involves these impacts, um, involves the solar winds um, hitting the surface.